Welcome back to the FS Derek channel and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, going flying today uh, mainly because I'm sort of finally getting the, the hang of this plane the Beechcraft B2200 no it's not the 2200 it's the 200 Beechcraft the King Air B200 and uh, there's a little look around it it's a, it's a nice plane you know it's a nice plane it's good for GA and it's good for it's not as quick as a jet but if you want to do international then then by all means now can you guess where I am anyone we'll give you just two seconds to have a little look around how about uh, if we do the free camera and then go up and uh, show you around there's a what appears to be a river estuary there big grass runway tarmac runway some uh, nice little uh, Art Deco terminal there and uh, God knows what that is going past there's some sort of monorail we're not in we're not in Japan don't worry we're in um, Shoreham and Shoreham was the first place I flew to flew from Manston to Shoreham and the reason for that was that uh, first of all they're very friendly in Shoreham so if you're a student pilot on your first solo and you get lost they're more inclined to help you out than say Biggin Hillwood for example or Rochester secondly it's about the right sort of uh, distance it's about you know about just under an hour's worth of flying um, thirdly um, there's a big lake halfway there called Wadhurst Lakes and you literally can't miss it you can see it from everywhere so all you've got to do is fly to Wadhurst Lakes and then carry on in the same direction for the same distance and time and you're at uh, Shoreham and then lastly of course um, you can't really miss Shoreham because it's right by the sea so obviously if you've got the sea on one side and the land on the other you know you're on the coast and secondly it's got this very distinctive um, uh, sort of uh, estuary so uh, you know you can't miss this river so when you've got there you can see the sea you can see the river you should be able to see Shoreham so I've had to pick a um, airport I, I need a home base South End is a fantastic airport and it's been recently upgraded and uh, it's got ILS and all sorts of stuff but the scenery and X planes not there yet so if you live near South End which I don't uh, and you you fancy yourself as a bit of a whiz at scenery can you please put some decent scenery in South End it would be well worth it um, but uh, I've chosen Shoreham because uh, I know Shoreham and uh, there's actually some scenery been written for it so let's jump back inside the plane what we're going to do I'm not I haven't got air traffic control on today because uh, those of you who watched the last video will know the trouble I had with it so I don't know where we're going to go I think we might go to Bristol today uh, so we'll have a little um, we'll have a little jaunt and go up you know go up see if we can go up now like I found out something that I didn't know last time and that was uh, the ALT warning ALT warning I was thinking it was a altimeter warning or an alternator warning in fact it's an altitude warning and this is a great thing about flight simulators you you learn as you go along you know this if you can ever and I think this is in, in with computer games in general if you can take it home and play it on the first day then it's you're not going to be happy with it it has to be a complete mystery uh, even two or three days or a week afterwards because um, the, the, the you know you have to learn something I think to get the most out of it and so our, so we had an altimeter warning which uh, and it was going black wasn't it the only thing that was putting me off was that when I went out of the cockpit and back into the cockpit it, it the lights came back on again and also the dimming of the lights fitted in with an alternator failure um, uh, and um, what was what it was doing was when it when you, it, you put yourself back in the cockpit it was sort of resetting your oxygen levels uh, and then you very quickly got hypoxic again and I think getting hypoxic is is when it goes black <clears throat> so I'm gonna just have a quick look and see if there's a hypoxia option here uh, aircraft Aircraft and situations might be equipment. I don't know whether it might be equipment failures. It must be, it should be some sort of options menu, shouldn't it? Operations and warnings. 
one of da, 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 da. there's nothing there about hypoxia is there I've got all these ticked because I think you know if you're going to do this in tall seriously like you, you should if you overspeed then you should lose your flaps and if you overspeed then you should lose no I mean you know you're going to crash aren't you if you overspeed basically with that option set remove the landing gear doors if you uh, go over the velocity the maximum velocity for landing gear extension yeah well fair enough nothing there about hypoxia so now this is and this is a bit of a pain because um, uh, it means we're going to be restricted to about 12,000 feet without it going black but that's something that we can test as we go along can't we so we can always uh, there's nothing there is there nothing like toggle oxygen or anything like that toggle aviation flashlight oh my god do you know we were complaining weren't we let's get in the plane and see if it works here we go environment date and time two in the morning right special no, view there we are toggle aviation flashlight oh my god this is exactly what we wanted wasn't it and it's in it's the fact it is a fact that you know you you're very rarely the first person to have thought of anything in any computer program so this is precisely what we wanted precisely what we wanted because we want to be able to turn the battery on and then we want to be able to put the starter on and then we want to uh, be able to start the engines so in the dark toggle aviation flashlight okay there's no um Come on, I'm not quite familiar with these settings in there. Tolo, there's not there's not a shortcut key for it, is there? But at least we know. I suppose the other thing we could do, we could have done the night vision goggles, couldn't we? Yeah, who's wearing night vision goggles? I mean seriously. Who's who's gonna be flying a plane wearing night vision goggles? Okay, well it's a lovely Sunday afternoon, so Let's. Uh, oh, let's not. What are we going to do? How are we going to do the weather? Let's set. Uh, let's set the weather uniformly. Come on, let's have a go at setting the weather. So we've got broken cumulus from uh, seven thousand, five thousand. Oh, it's all quite low, isn't it? Cloud base at twelve hundred, up to three thousand two hundred. A few cumulus, and then a scattered cumulus between three two and five two, and then broken cumulus between five and seven. What do they call that? Visibility 10, 10 SM. Surely that should be 10 NM, 10 nautical miles. 10 SM VFR. Well, VFR means visual flight rules, which means that we can fly visually. So if we, we, we click VFR, then it will set VFR weather. I mean, this is good. M, I don't know what M is. It might be marginal VFR. Um, press is precision and then category 1, 2 and 3 are the various um, weathers which are a nightmare to land in that you need uh, category 3 is the worst um, we can do marginal VFR couldn't we here we are on the ground at uh, Shoreham marginal VFR would be alright won't it we want to go up high don't we Barometric pressure at sea level 10, 20 and 13 degrees. In the UK we use millibars. I know the, uh, in America you use inches of mercury. But then you're very funny about your units in America. You're still using inches and feet and stuff like that, which we did until we um, adopted the metric system. And you've got metric money, which we didn't until we went metric. and. Uh, but then your ton isn't the same as our ton. We don't use a metric ton, we use a British ton, you use an American ton. And what's that all about? Same with a gallon. If you're flying a plane and the manual is in, it's an American plane and it's got American gallons in it, which you know they mostly do, um, then you can't even do a gallon to litre conversion because they sell fuel over here in litres because your gallon's not the same as our gallon so you have to convert American gallons to English gallons to, 
to litres. Anyway, enough of that. So, yeah, so is that suitably horrendous? I reckon that's suitably horrendous, isn't it? Five, five, uh, five miles of visibility. Okay, so just press enter to get rid of that. And then we're going to um, put ourselves back in. Now, as far as date of time goes, let's have a thing here now. We're in we're in October. It's about it's about the twenty fourth, I think. And um, now, what time will we go flying in October? Well, we'd get up. Let's have a think. We'd get up about read the paper, have a cup of tea, think about going flying, drive to the flying club, fart about, have a cup of tea. Um, so it'd be lucky to be get up in the air about half past twelve, I'd imagine, because by then you're starting to think, oh, it's going to be dark by the time I get down again. If I don't go now, I'm never going to go. So, let's do that. So press enter. So it's twelve twenty-eight, and we've got ideally we're going to go to Bath. Going to go and have a bath. So. Let's um, now. I'll, so we'll get the plane started. Check we've got enough fuel. Uh, I'm just going to flick the battery on, and it will tell us. Yeah, we've got plenty of fuel. As far as the weight and balance goes, now what can I tell you about weight and balance? Aircraft weight and f weight and fuel, and obviously balance. Here's the centre of gravity. Is the balance. If it's too far forward, then the plane will tend to want to dive into the ground all the time, which is a nuisance. And if it's too far back, then the plane's going to want to climb all the time. And this can get very, very difficult on final approach if you're out of balance. And if a plane takes off and crashes pretty soon afterwards, especially if it's a small plane with a private pilot, the first thing they'll do is try and find some evidence that they did a weight and balance thing. Not the balance so much, but the weight. It's very, very common to overload planes uh, you know four blokes decide that they're going to go to a, a fly-in or something and on the spur of the moment they all pile in this tiny little plane just about cram themselves in like sardines in a tin and none of them weighs themselves or knows or, or bothers to our pilot never asked, bothers to ask them how much they all weigh because they all weigh sort of about five kilos or ten kilos or twenty kilos more than than they care to admit so they never even tell the truth that's a good I mean let's have a let's have a go let's supposing we're going full up so there's seven seats there's two four six seven seats in the passenger and two for the pilot so we've got nine people haven't we and it's in pounds so let's get the old calculator up See if I can get it up. I can get it up, but I can't see it. So because it's hogged the screen. So that's not to worry. Let's just do it in a head. So say so a heavy person will weigh about two hundred pounds, wouldn't they? So we've got nine people. So let's say they weigh about one hundred and fifty pounds on average. So that's nine times one hundred and fifty, which is thirteen fifty. So let's put in thirteen fifty in pounds. Yeah, so we're still okay, aren't we? Because with the fuel that we've got on, we've got about um, two thousand pounds of fuel, which is three point two hours flying. We can put a little bit more on, let's say four, and then uh, we've got a bit of payload going on. So we've oh no, sorry, um, payload is the passengers. So we said about thirteen hundred. So let's knock it up to about two thousand say nineteen hundred that's six hundred pounds of baggage I mean that's a lot of baggage and there's your golf clubs and everything in there so and um, we're so we're still below the um, twelve thousand six hundred maximum allowable weight with with three hundred feet and the center of gravity is uh, I don't know if it's recalculated that I presume it has I don't know why we've got fuel left and right and fuel tanks because if you move them I suppose it allows you to load the tanks up differentially um, which you know which I mean it's very rare for you to have the same fuel in both tanks exactly the same fuel because you can't measure what's in it you can put the same t fuel in both tanks but you don't know what's in there already so um, you know you sort of have to assume that uh, there we go let's get rid of that so we've got yeah so we've got about 900 uh, pounds of fuel in each tank now which is which is fine it's going to mean make for quite a heavy flight but that's not a problem those clouds look a bit low don't they 
So let's get this baby started. So here we go. Oh no, no, that's not right. Here we don't go. There's the, I'm going to just turn these off to uh, account for uh, ease of use. And then you put that sort of in the middle there. You see where it's sort of is, as much in the lower one as it is in the upper one. I'll just turn this down. There. I'll turn it down a bit because you can take it for granted that you know what's going on. The engine's starting up. This is a neat trick. You can open the window and you get more noise. Seems to keep starting. Let's turn the starter off. Put the generator on. What you would do really is put the beacon on. As soon as you put the battery on, put the beacon on because uh, you want to warn the ground crew, you know, or anyone who's walking around. And there are always people walking around these airfields uh, that um, they're starting up. So let's put on starter number two. And put it down to give it a little smidge of fuel. inside where it's quiet. Generator on, starter off. So, landing lights, taxi lights, recognition lights, strobe lights, tail. I don't think there is a any lighting on the tail. It's annoying. They've got the way that the cursor keys work, if the cursor keys, the left and right cursor keys go left and right, and the up and down ones go up and down, I suppose, <laughs> if you look at it like that. Except because we're used to moving in two dimensions, I'm, I'm expecting it to go forwards and back. The forwards and back keys, or rather the in and out keys, are the um, comma and the full stop or period, or the, or the uh, angle bracket key. And so that's going to take a lot of getting used to. So, let's get the passengers inside. Almost went away, didn't they? Now, okay, so here's something about the. Let's just shut that and go in here. Now, I'll click on window reflections, and you'll see that we're now we've now got window reflections. See that? That's window reflections off, and that's window reflections on. And if I go back to the date and time and put us back in the middle of the night, and. Now I can't see a thing, but with my special view aviation flashlight, I can turn the lights on. So view aviation flashlight off, and you should see that we've got some pretty pretty damn good reflections, haven't we? That's with them off, and that's with them on. Yeah. Okay. Now, why haven't we had those before? Well, the answer is I've always been flying in areas where there are there, there was rain. And uh, don't ask me why, I'm just unlucky. Let's um, let's set the date and time back to where it was. What did I say about half twelve, didn't I? That'll do. See, now we'll make it a bit. We'll make it, we'll make it nearer one because this is this is the first thing you need to learn about flying is everything takes longer than you think. So we're now, we're already late. We're expected in Bristol and we're already late. Yeah, so when it rains, you get fantastic raindrops on the windscreen, but you can't get the reflections. Or, you can fly where there's no rain, get the reflections, and obviously you don't don't get the rain. So that's a little um, idiosyncrasy. Oh, it's not going to call it a bug, an idiosyncrasy of the plane, which again they don't explain to you very clearly. Uh, in fact, there's not a tremendous amount of documentation with this plane. You know, it's, it's it's a bit of an adventure finding out how to fly it. So. Um, do we need anything on any anti-icing? What's the temperature? Let's have a look down here. We can't tell because we haven't got the electrics turned on. So. 500. Electrics on 13 degrees Celsius is uh, reporting. Um, let's uh, squawk. 
equal to 700 which again is not really going to be very relevant the barometric pressure is 29.31 which is set for 29.31 which is odd because it's, it's, it's at um, minus 700 feet there's no way we're 700 feet below sea level is there? no way that we're 700 feet below sea level so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be, I'm going to wind us to zero. There we go. Oh, oh! Don't tell me that's the barometric pressure that I've got set. That's not the world barometric pressure. Oh, I don't believe it. Okay, Just learning, learning all the time settings, data input and output. So I've got the frame rate, which I'm not that bothered about now. The system pressures are the aircraft pressures. They're not the atmosphere. So we want the atmosphere weather. Let's see if that... Inches of mercury, 30.12. And what are we done in 30.11? So that's so we did the right thing, didn't we? The That's the what they call the Q&H. And there's lots of codes in flying. They all begin with Q, so you've got QNH, QNF, QFE, QDM, etc., etc. And they all mean different things. They're a bit like the trucker's code, the 10 codes. Um, but there's only a few that are really important. The two relating to pressure that are important are QNH and QFE. QNH is the pressure at sea level, which means that if you dial in the QNH, let's say that the QNH was um, 30.5. Point five. So if we dial in 30.5, no, sorry, let's do it the other way around. Let's say it's 30.27, yeah, or, or 1,025 millibars. Let's say that, so that's the QNH. So now it's telling me I'm 142 feet above sea level, which if you're on the ground, um, you know, unless you're in the Dead Sea or somewhere, um, you'd, you know, that, that, that's what you'd expect, isn't it? So that's with the QNH dialed in, it gives you your, um, your height above sea. Now, if you... Um, reset that to zero then you get another pressure setting 30.11 which is lower and that's the QFE and that's the pressure setting at the, on the ground where you're sitting now at the level at which you're sitting that's the, the actual outside pressure and that's useful of course because um, most of the time we don't land on the sea you were landing on the runway and you don't want to know how high the sea is you want to know how high the runway is so uh, in general, what we use is we use the QNH for navigating long distances, and uh, we use the QFE for local navigation. So we're going to set that as the the QFE. Well, no, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll set the QNH because we're going to take off and f off, aren't we? As they say, they do. It looks like because we're right next to the sea anyway. So I mean, we're pretty well at sea level anyway, aren't we? Okay, so let's stop farting about. Um, let's. Um, Set the altimeter to 10,000. Things happen very fast in planes when you're flying, and unlike a car, you can't really pull into a lay-by and uh, get out a map or um, you know stop and uh, uh, and do anything. So everything has to be done in real time in planes. So you really should do quite a bit of preparation on the ground, and that's what I'm doing now. So let's clear. Let's go to the flight plan. Let's clear that. So we've got no no flight plan here. So what I'm going to do is holding the mouse with my left hand. Oh, I can't suppose I could do it all with one hand. It's difficult to stop the mouse moving while you're you're doing the wheel. Then that's a trouble. So we're departing from Shoreham, which my map tells me is Echo Golf Kilo Alpha. So let's do Echo. Golf Kilo and then enter, enter, accept. Right, and if we are going to go to Bristol, where are we going to go next? Well, uh, you know, you, I mean, you obviously can't see the map, so I can see the map. So it really depends whether we're going to straight line or if we're going to straight line, we're going to infringe on Southampton's control zone. So let's do that. <laughs> let's uh, first we'll go to Goodwood, which is GWC. So uh, G.
W. You can actually save these, so fast forward a bit if you're getting bored. I'll see if I can save it. Enter, enter. And then from Goodwood we'll go to uh, Southampton, which has its own VOR, BHF Omnidirectional Rangefinder. So that's SAM. S A M. Enter, enter, enter. It asks for an additional confirmation there because there's a, um, a an SAM somewhere else in the world. You have to watch that because um, if, you, if it says distance three mile, no point three miles, distance seventeen miles, and then distance two thousand five hundred miles, you've got the wrong one. But it will usually offer up the UK one first, or rather, it'll offer up the one nearest to the previous one, I presume. So, so from Southampton, we're going to go. Um, there's not much in the way of uh, navigation aids now as we go west. So, really, the bit, the next thing will probably be just to go straight to. Um, Bristol and Bristol is Echo Golf Golf Delta. Let's just check that. Yeah. Echo Golf Golf Delta. There's a culture of checking things in uh, in aviation um, that you don't really find anywhere else. Um, it's quite normal to ask someone to check something you've done. Just anyone who's around, you know, just anyone. I mean, that, obviously if it's a pilot thing you ask another pilot to check it. Bristol. So if there were two pilots in the cockpit, we one of the, one of us would do this and the other one would check it. Um, there we are, 57 miles. So in, that, don't, in total that's going to be about 100 nautical miles. It's not massively long, is it? Uh, Shoreham departure frequency, well, we're not using departures. That one, two, three, one, five. So let's just change that to one, five. There we go. Make it the active frequency, and put it all back. So that's that all done. Now, um, what runway are we going to take off on? Well, I don't know. Let's just taxi out and have a look, shall we? Press C. be able to see. And uh, if I look down using the hat on the joystick, if we turn left and then immediately turn right again. Oh no, we could double back I suppose. Let's double back. And then and then that will take us to the holding point for the um, for this runway here. Which we can deal with when we get there. Right, jump back in plane. So, uh, we're going to do uh, all the usual request radio check, tell them what departure information we've got, and uh, we want a taxi. Taxi! And, uh, we'll check everything's okay. Brakes off. And left turn. Checking, of course, that there's nothing over to the left, like another aircraft that's snuck in behind us or something. When you're steering a plane, um, you, you would think what you would do is sort of you could do it on the engines, wouldn't you? And in fact, you probably can do it on the engines. In practice, most of the time, you we stopped. See, so you had to go forwards there a bit to get it to turn. Where did that come from? Remember that plane being there. Sorry, we're going in the right direction. Yeah, so you tend to steer on the tow brakes. Um, so what you do is you sort of get a bit of forward speed going and uh, then you poke your toe out and... Uh, and sort of screech around. Not a brilliant way of taxiing. Just watch the end of the wing here because you don't want to. It's 
bit embarrassing if you bump into other planes. Not to mention highly expensive. Now, how fast should you taxi? Well, the walking speed, they say. But who are they? What do they know? Ha! Um, I mean, you know, you're in a plane that's designed to land at uh, 100 miles an hour. It doesn't really look like a land-based vehicle that could do 100 miles an hour, does it? But it can. And uh, so, you know, why don't you taxi at 70 miles an hour? Well, the answer is it's will be quite difficult to stop. <laughs> we don't have the brakes of a Bugatti Veyron on this. And you get, you know, and as I say, things in aviation happen fast enough without you speeding them up. So that's uh, you know just a, a running pace I would say. Although you'll find that a lot of the um, you know the, the, big, the bad pilots, the, the old the mad bad pilots, uh, will taxi fast, uh, especially on tarmac because it's very smooth. Um, on grass, obviously, you'd be you'd be mad to taxi too fast on grass because if your front wheel goes down a rut, then that's the the double line there you can see is the um, whole short line for the runway yeah so you know as well if you think about it you know as well it's got a fantastic amount of weight on it hasn't it it's got the it's got the engine and uh, probably at least a third of all the uh, the weight and it's only a little sticky out thing out the front it's a terrible angle in terms of and, and quite usually it's got some sort of training wheel on it. If you don't have nose wheel steering, it'll have a training link wheel. Like a like a shopping a supermarket trolley. So you don't want to be going mad. Now, let's just do a final check. What you would normally do is you do what they call a power run-up, which is basically you um, put your, your brake on, you face the plane into wind, and um, you know, and uh, then uh, sort of give it some welly on the engines. The the key being to give it as much as you can without it. Uh, starting to creep forwards because once the once you start uh, screeching forwards and wearing the tyres out, you're doing it wrong. So there, we're giving it over. You know, well that's takeoff power there. And this is quite, I don't know, it's it's a bit disconcerting for the passengers, and it's, it can be a bit scary as a pilot actually to rev a plane up to this extent on the ground. But what we're looking at is is there all these sort of things, you know. Are is the oil warmed up? Is the oil temperatures and pressures okay? Are, is this all equal? Are they the both the same on both sides? Uh, and it does seem to be fine. And the other thing um, you can do is you can, with a if you've got a key, you can check the magnetos and things like this. Uh, and then what you do is you then throttle back to nothing and see if the plane stalls because let's say you're in the air and let's say you had a suspected you had an engine fire and you wanted to throttle back to nothing um, would you be able to do it without having to restart the engines and the answer is you know you would want to be able to just to idle without restarting the engines so that all seems to be okay seeing as I turned failures off in the last thing I should really well hope so so let's put the stick back I'm not going to use flaps. I don't think I'm going to use flaps. So, is everyone happy? Turn around, ask all the passengers. Everyone, don't forget we've got seven people in the back and a co pilot. So, let's just check everyone's happy. And if so, I'll just hold it on the brakes.
because it's quite a short runway. Let the prop stabilise. Feed in the power. If it wants to go. And by doing it this way, you've got the advantage of you've got the takeoff torque power set already. Don't worry that we've got a big load of um, hills behind here. So 110 roughly rotate and keep it at about 120 G for gear up. And what are we flying? We're flying about 020, aren't we? So and we're going to we're going to want to fly west. Go west, young man. Let's just get the torque up a bit. Bearing in mind I was a bit worried about the torque. We had an engine failure, didn't we? Torque-based engine failure last time. Now we're going to fly into cloud, and here's another tip: if you're flying into cloud, don't don't look out the window until you fly into cloud, and then think, "Oh my God, I better what are the instruments doing?" Look at the instruments before you fly into the cloud. Get flying on instruments before you hit the cloud, <coughs> and that way you really won't worry at all. You see, I'm absolutely fine because I was just, you know, like 10 seconds or so before I went into the cloud, I thought, right. Let's get myself acclimatised to the instruments and, and we're fine. Um, let's put the autopilot on. So, autopilot engage. We're going to seek the altitude that we've got set, which is 10,000, and we're going to fly on the uh, nav, which we want to be the GPS. So, we should expect it to turn left. So let's press this, press this, I believe, switches between V-lock and GPS. In fact we can check that, uh, oh, it's so annoying the fact that it starts so high up, I presume it's because these don't do anything, although they might do. So let's just check, we've still got 120 knots on the climb. Get rid of the flight plan and go to the second nav page for the map. That's where we took off from, so we were a bit north and we were going to want to reacquire that line, aren't we? So that all seems to be going fine, and we're on GPS. Now let's just check for a second, I'll press that and see if it goes back to V lock. Yes. Okay, so that's a quick way of switching, which we, I mean, you can switch with this thing here, and if memory serves, you can all. So switch with this thing, this thing uh, here. You see that changes as well? In fact it changes but it doesn't change back. It's somewhat disconcerting. So let's get rid of the autopilot. Now I'm going to be interested to see how the autopilot works with this because we've got altitude selected. You you can actually fly at an altitude. Now if I press the altitude now, well they would assume that I wanted to stay at 5,500 feet say and it would put 5,500 feet in here and level off. So you don't want to really press that. If you press climb then it will assume that you want to do a climb. Just check that we've got the torque turned up enough here because we always have to increase the torque down as we climb. If you press climb it will put you in a climb and that's what I've been using so far and it's, it says it's a default 1500 feet a minute climb or something but it doesn't, it's actually 800 feet a minute. Um, the reason why I'm not pressing anything is because it's, look at it, it's lovely, it's a 120 knot climb and first rule of aviation is if everything's working really well don't disturb it. <laughs> um, now and um, yeah, so but here altitude select means that it will it won't just hold an altitude and it won't just climb. It'll actually seek that altitude that you've selected, which is ten thousand feet. But in a way, it's almost doing it so well because it's got it's got a two thousand feet per minute climb on, which might be correct. Maybe what it's 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 
it's doing what it's supposed to, which will be great. In the future, I will then use altitude select. Um, or it may be that it's just been set up so perfectly by a person unnamed that it's it's doing a fantastic uh, climb on its own. You know, in other words, it's just nobody's nobody's controlling the pitch. <laughs> So this green bar is coming back on, on track and don't forget where it's pointing as far as the GPS is concerned doesn't make any difference. You can you can literally point it wherever you like. You know. What what you can do if you're if you want to is sort of try and find out what you should be doing. So you desire track two seventy four so you can you can sort of set it to there's 274 pretty much. I'm reading it off of here and the now here we are look. Now we're coming up on the oh no it's doing it. Now that's brilliant. Okay, okay, okay. Feature working. That's exactly what we want. 120 knot climb, 2,000 feet a minute, that was lovely. And look, hey Bosch Bosch, we're up at 10,000 feet already. Nudge the uh talk forward a bit. And just about to uh, cross the path that we're supposed to be on. In fact, it looks like it's drifting away a bit to the right, so I'm a bit concerned that it's not following the uh, GPS. Why is it not following the GPS? Why is it not taking its commands from the GPS? Come on, come on, come on. And let it get off course a bit, but it really shouldn't let it get too far off course. It should really be turning right. So we look at the autopilot again. It's come off of nav. Why has it disconnected the nav? Did it come off of nav when it came off of altitude select? Your guess is as good as mine. Anyway. A lot of fault detection and diagnosis, isn't there, in this flying lark? Now, we're up. There we are. It looks like that red line is obviously the uh, GPS line, isn't it? And the green line will go back to the middle when, when we're back on track. And really, if we wanted to fly at 10,000 feet, that would be about as far as we, um, we needed, all we needed to do. What we would do at this point is do a feeder check. So we'll check the fuel, radio, engines direction indicator, alt attitude indicator, an altimeter, um, but what I, w and then, and then uh, course the prop, in other words change up a gear so that we can cruise more fuel efficiently. Um, but what I want to do is actually climb up a bit more and check this hypoxia thing. So I'm going to ask it to climb up to 15,000, so, and I'll do that now with our new fan method of dialing in 15,000, going to the autopilot and clicking autopilot select. So that's definitely on nav isn't it? And it's definitely on out select. And there we go, off we go, we're off into a climb again. Now why do we keep the props fine in climb and the descent? Well in the climb, because in the same way as if you're driving a car up a hill you'd keep it in a low gear so it needs to be uh, able to because uh, it's, it's flying more slowly for the most part so it's gone into a 400 feet per minute climb which is not pretty particularly aggressive is it I suppose it's treating it as an en route climb rather than an initial climb um, and um, so you only adjust the coarseness of the prop angle in on route, you know, when you when you're sort of cruising, and that's these two things here, which is uh, F3. I think you can adjust one or the other, or this. There's a hotspot in the middle for doing them both. It doesn't seem to do both of them very equally. Let's put them both forward. Because I'm why I use the keyboard F3 to bring those back, because it brings them back exactly identically. Uh, 
Let's see if I can expedite the climb a bit. 800 feet a minute would be better. Mm, mind you. You know, what did I just say? What did I say about not disturbing something that's working? As you can see here, we're now over Goodwood. The reason you can't read that is because it's got the GWC overlaid on the Chichester Goodwood um, Echo Golf Hotel Romeo. So, can we declutter that? Can we declutter that? Data fields on. Oh, I'd like data fields on. There we are. So we're going, we're going to um, Southampton and we want to fly 286 and we're flying 286 and it's 18.5 nautical miles away and bearing in mind that 60 nautical miles an hour is one nautical mile a minute and we're going nearly four times that we're doing four nautical miles a minute so you can we can tell it's gonna probably take about three four or five minutes to get there isn't it People who review this plane all say the same thing, it's quick, it's quick, and it is quick. So, we all, um, we're sitting up here and uh, waiting to pass out from hypoxia, see if it happens. I'll show you um, down here, let's just get this almost out of the way. That's obviously the autopilot. Uh, but over here is the oxygen equipment. And I'm just going to gently dial up the, the cabin altitude and the aircraft altitude. Now, they're on the same dial. So I'm assuming that, say, let's say the aircraft altitude is 21,000. It depressurizes the cabin to 3,300. We're nowhere near that. I mean, we are at uh, we're at 15. Well, we're we're going up to 15, aren't we? So and it looks like it pretty well assumes that you're um, you're going to be okay. I'm no, I would I wouldn't be okay at 15,000 with no oxygen. Cabin pressure dump. Having pressure dump. We don't want to dump anything. We want to build it up, not dump it. So let's tell it we're going up to 20,000 feet. And then this is the rate. So where are we with that? Can't see anything. I'm going to turn it up a bit, assuming that up is more. Now, let's go back and are there any dials relating to oxygen consumption? They're going to be somewhere weird because it's not the sort of thing you want to want to look at all the time. So let's just have a look here. That's the emergency locator beacon which emergency use only, we should have pushed that shouldn't I when I was in the channel it's minus nine celsius so it's, it's uh, below zero and we're not actually flying in cloud but not actually flying out of it either are we so um, I might just uh, put the pito heat on stall warner that's, I don't know whether that just heats the stall warner or turns it on, I just hope it heats it um, we can arm the auto feathering, which um, turns the props at right angles to the airflow if um, one of the engines fails. Windshield anti ice prop auto fuel left vent right. Fuel vent left and right. Phew! Just dumped about 10 quid's worth of fuel out there. Hydraulic fluid sensor, that's a that's a, um, a fuse because it's got a 5 on it, which is a 5 amp fuse. 
The landing lights and the taxi lights we really don't need on. The navigation lights, <laughs> if we put, put the icing on instead of the, of the nav lights. Oh. Oh. Now, what have we got down here? This, no, I don't like the way that shadow's uh, moving about, so let's have a quick look and see what's going on. Looks like we've just made our turn, doesn't it, onto we're at Southampton. So it's no use. Um, we're going to be at Bristol before I've done anything. I want unbelievable. I'm going to need a slower plane. I'm still only at eleven thousand. I'm at eleven thousand six hundred. Can you see that? And it's not climbing. So why isn't it climbing? I've got the altitude select still on. I can think why it might have lost a bit of altitude in the turn, but I can't think why. Let's go into a climb. No, not down up. Let's go into a climb, come on. We're going to have to stooge around at uh, Bristol to get down again. I want to get to the bottom of this altitude warning. If you look up here, it, uh, if it's predictable, it should come on, come on again in any time soon. What have we got here? This is not how you learn to fly a plane, by the way. You don't just buy one and fly it around, trying to work out what everything does. Cabin coffee, yes. Let's get something on. Cabin bright and dim. So that's the IQ switch. That's why I'm in trouble. I'm on dim. No smoking signs on. Yeah, definitely no smoking. Cabin temperature. I tend to like it a bit cool. It's just cabin temperature high, low. Now what's he got over here? He's got some stuff. Gyro suction, that's the gyroscope. Number of hours on the Hobbs meter. Oh that's interesting. Ah! Oh, 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 Mr. Peebley. Look at that. An oxygen gauge. So we've got oxygen on board. These will just be the same as my instruments. Right, back to normal. Back to normal, please. As you were. What is that you're saying? Your yoke's fallen off. Have another one. The yoke's on you. Right, look, there we are. Altitude warning. Altitude warning. We need oxygen. What's the first thing you do? Press altitude. Don't want to climb any higher. Put it in a descent, but just a gradual descent. So let's gradually descend to about 14,000 feet. descend to about 13,000 feet. And if you press that. Makes a clicky noise. It actually says push to cancel. Push to cancel. Push to cancel. Hmm. 
would be nice if it. Um, I mean, I think in the um, documentation it says that you push that to um, to go down to that altitude. In other words, push to target that. But um, still got the altitude warning on. But I'm going to go down to twelve thousand nine. Well, do you know, we might as well descend now anyway. We might as well. Let's have a look. We are we're thirty eight miles from Gulf Delta and let's say four multiplied by three, so twelve thousand feet, so we're too high. we as usual we're too high because we've been we've been fluffing about, haven't we? So let's put a, a a turn in. So let's fly away from it basically. So I'm going to change the heading bug, which is what you do whenever you I'm going to put it slightly to the left and then tell it to fly on the heading and it'll make a left turn and that's quite important because a degree or two the other way if I'd set it slightly to the right it would have made a right turn so you need to make your mind up which way you want to turn obviously you don't want to turn towards control airspace in general with aircraft you really want to turn to the left why do you want to turn to the left? I'm not going to tell you. That's, that is your. That's your uh, job to think about that, and I'll tell you when we land. In an aircraft, why would you normally turn to the left? And there's a series of other questions, all that all relate to the same answer, which is why, if two aircraft are overtaking each other, supposing that we were coming up behind another aircraft, and we were going to overtake it, will we overtake it on the right, or will we overtake it on the left? And the answer is you overtake it on the right. Now, and for the same reason as as a plane always turns left. Now, because we're descending, I'm going to cut the throttle back a bit. And we never really got into the cruise, so I never got a chance to cause the prop. So I'm, we're descending. I would normally I would find the prop. Why do you find the prop on the descent? Because a it doesn't matter the props really just windmilling anyway for the most part and secondly um, is that the Thames in front of us? see that from the no, it, can't be. it must be the Solent that must be Southampton right we're down at 12,900 so let's take it down to say 8,900 let's press this see what happens don't me. We're in a four hundred knot descent. Otherwise, nine is a nice gentle descent. Well, it's just you know, putting a screaming, hair raising descent. One that is quite likely to overspeed the engines, so let's just uh, throttle back a bit and be a bit more precise about where we want to end up because we want to end up, say, about flight level 70. How do you get to flight levels? You knock off the last two digits, and so this is flight level 70. Technically, it's only flight level 70 if you've got the uh, the barometric pressure set to the standard which is 29.91 so when when it shows uh, 7,000 feet on here it won't, it'll be 7,000 feet above sea level which is flight level 70 here's another question all related to the same answer two aircraft are taxiing on the ground towards each other head on nose to nose which way should they turn, left or right? And I'll tell you again. It's related to the same answer. They should both turn right. But there's a reason for that. It's not a convention. It's not because we drive on the right in, a in aviation. Here's another one. Aircraft taxiing down the runway but it's a grass strip and he wants to see what the condition of the runway is 
with any, any large pieces of debris from previous aircraft still on it. No point taxiing down the centre. Should he taxi down the left or should he taxi down the right hand edge? To inspect the runway. And the answer is should taxi down the right hand edge. Now you should be able to get it from that clue because that's that's pretty blatantly obvious why. But it's the same reason. Let's just cut this back a bit. So we're going off we're off the old uh, line now aren't we? But then you'd expect that because um, we're only going to get back on it when we turn around again. So let's see how we're doing. Let's do the old altitude calculation. So we're now 50 miles away, so we can afford to be at 15,000 feet. So in fact, we're well low now, aren't we? So in, if we go back and uh, to the autopilot and tell it to fly back on the nav, which is basically again the GPS, what it'll do is it'll reacquire this purple line and carry on flying, but at 5,000 feet instead of uh, 15. I'm going to have to get to the bottom of that altitude thing because, um, you know, you don't don't assume that uh, necessarily everyone else knows the answer. It may be that maybe that nobody's uh, bothered flying this plane at more than ten thousand or twelve thousand feet. I'll leave that on there for a minute because it is interesting. Just zoom in a bit, and you'll see. The old uh, GPS is quite intelligent. It does know that it's supposed to be on that line, and what it'll do is it'll it will intercept the line. Now it, it doesn't want to fly through it at right angles because it's you can't really intercept anything properly if you're flying through it at right angles. So it's going to want to fly in some an intercept angle, and the intercept angle in aviation is almost 30 degrees. It's almost always 30 degrees. So if you're flying, and that's because a 30 degree turn is a standard turn on an aircraft. So um, you know, if you if you come across something and you want to turn to follow it, 30 degree turn not that not that tricky. Here we're less, aren't we? Because we we want to be flying 297 and it's down to 318, 317. So there's only 19, 18, 17 degrees now. So it's doing a gradual intercept. And if we um, we put this away. You have to click on this one. There's no point clicking on this one. You have to click on this one to put it away. Um, if we look, we see the red lines coming back on again and the green lines coming back on again. I think it actually sets the green line up for you. You don't need to make it agree with your course. It will set it up for you automatically, which is nice. So we're coming down to 7,000 feet. We're still we're going fast, but this is what I was saying on the last trip about you go up slowly but you come down fast so overall you gain time so that's good 7000 and 400 is a nice little time isn't it I'm wondering if it sets 400 as the, 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 the descent rather if it sets 400 as the descent because um, if you wanted to descend on finals um, you could actually have get a landing off of that if we look at the talking of 30 degree turns Remember this was 10, 20, 30 degrees, then it's 45 and 60. And this was um, 20 degrees we decided, didn't we? So if you wanted to do a 30 degree turn, what you'd need to do is turn until that triangle here was pointing to the, the major marker there. And <coughs> technically, if you're going, I think it's 160 knots, and you're turning at 30 degrees then it'll take you two minutes to complete a complete turn that's 360 degrees I may be wrong on that so don't quote me but if you look here you can see here two minutes you may have wondered what this instrument is because really it doesn't get much use it's a standby attitude indicator and basically it gives you the same sort of information as this does except it does it electronically and if you're turning left 30 degrees then that will that's that mark there and if you're turning right 30 degrees the right standard turn then uh, you're 30 degrees to the right so if you had an electric um, if you had a it's really an electric failure it would all pack up wouldn't it that's why I have to do failures in another let's just get the talk back up we could do failures couldn't we in another tutorial that would be quite challenging wouldn't it 
give myself an electrical failure and see if I can recover from it based on the knowledge I've got now. <laughs> Probably not, wouldn't fly with me on that one. So, and but you, can you see there it says two minute turn, two minute turn, and that's this thing here, two minute turn to the left, two minute turn to the right, which is a 30 degree turn, which is re just reassuring you that you're not upside down. And then this ball, if I just muck about with the rudders a bit, you should see that ball go from left to right because it shows you whether you're skidding. And skidding is where you are yawing to the left or yawing to the right, but not going in the direction that the plane's pointing. So it's like, literally like skidding in a car sideways. If that ball's in the middle, you're not skidding. And everyone is sitting nice and comfortably with the weight going directly down through the seat. If you start skidding, then people are going to start feeling sick because they're going to feel like they're moving sideways as well as forwards, which is not good. Right, distance 37 miles, knock off the, so say 3.7 multiplied by 3, we've got about 10, so 10,000 feet, that's fine. If we're flying at 7, then in fact we'll be okay till about 25 miles, won't we? 25 2.5 multiplied by 3, 7.5, so about 20 miles we'll, we'll need to start descending. So again, come on, let's do the mass. 20 miles is in 15 miles time. We're going 4 miles a minute, so that's going to be in about 4 minutes, isn't it? Not that we're going to measure that. You could measure that. There is a, there's a clock down here. Let's see if we can put it on there. Let's mash the buttons. There we are. So we've got the timer on now for four minutes. So stick the egg on. We'll have a boiled egg when we get there. Just flying around with absolutely nothing to see is uh, is a, it can be a bit daunting, can't it? I mean, you have to really sort of um, be quite confident in your instrument navigation lots of people have lots of people have crashed because they've been got into cloud and not really known how to use the instruments to get where they needed to go now talking of getting where we needed to go in the three minutes and 40 seconds 20 seconds that we've got left we have to decide what we're going to do when we do get there so we need to choose the procedure the landing procedure so we want to select the approach and in fact there's only one ILS and it's zero 09 so let's enter that and we'll say vectors and we'll load that and if we go to the flight plan we shall see that it is loaded so we're on the vectors for 09 which is the easterly runway and we're approaching from the east so we're going to need to overfly Bristol and come back around into the ILS now let's see if we can get any information Oh, save the flight plan. That was good. Let's save that. Right. Let's see if we can get any information about the... Uh, if that happens, press clear straight away. And do the big arrow down, ILS. Uh, I want some... No, no, it actually should be on the nav page. There we go. Echo go Bob Delta. Nearest airport, that's jolly useful. <coughs> that tells you um, where you can go. It's got not all the nearest everything as well. Not just the nearest airport. Let's go back to the waypoint chapter. And Echo Golf Golf Delta. Let's just double check that's correct. Yes. So the tower is one three three decimal eight five. That's good, isn't it? One three three eight five. Well, actually, we wanted the ILS frequency, didn't we? AWOS. What's an AWOS? One three three eight five. Well, we may not be able to get the ILS frequency then. There are there's more than one way to skill account. Let's just put the tower frequency one three three decimal eight five. So here's the comms. Big one down to one three three and eight five done. 
there are far more smaller frequencies than there used to be. There only used to be about eight decimal subdivisions. There are about 20 or 30 now. I don't know how many. <clears throat> how to upgrade every radio to cope with that. Yeah, runway 9. Elevation 622. So it is a fair old bit above sea level, isn't it? So <clears throat> it'll be quite important that we get the um, ILS correct. They're not the ILS, the Q&H, what I'm talking about. So let's have a quick look and see. We've got 29991 in there. So according to this, it's 30.12. Notice that every time you do this, if you're flying an altitude, it changes your, your altitude. What we want to do is, is really start to come down now, I think. So I'm going to just get us started. So go down a bit, get started a bit, and then do the rest. And because it's... let's do a proper descent. Down, down. Deeper than down. So we're on the we're 15 miles away to the east, and we're going to want to overfly it. So I'm going to overfly it. <coughs> it's 600. We'll be in their control zone anyway, so let's just assume we're under air traffic control. Get rid of the flying plan. Go back to the nav chapter. Go to the second page in the nav chapter. Zoom out of it. There we are. So we're going to overfly it, and then we're going to turn left, and we're going to go out, fly out 270, which is the reciprocal of the runway. And then when we're happy, we're about to. When we're about 12 miles out, we'll turn around and fly back. You notice my cold is still not gone away. So how are we going to fly out to 70? Yes, we're going to fly it on the bug. So let's set the bug to 270. Try not to drag this off the screen because if you drag it off the screen it goes mental. Come on. It's going mental anyway. 270. There we go. So the heading bug's set up for 270 for when we get there. Let's just zoom in a bit. Right, medical emergency over. We're over speeding. Why didn't somebody mention that? Okay. So, we're pretty well there now, aren't we? Arriving at the waypoint. So now, we'll tell it to stay on the heading bug.
So we're heading west. We're pretty much at 2,500 feet. We're slowing down. The sector safe altitude for this part of the country is 1300 feet. And the sector safe altitude is the highest point in, in the particular square of the map that we're in. But that doesn't mean 1300 feet is a safe altitude to fly at, it just means that that's the. That's uh, the highest point, so you have to fly obviously above that. And in general, the clearance is 500 feet, so it's 500. The air law states you have to fly 500 feet clear of any person, vehicle, vessel, or object. Uh, and obviously, this is some sort of object, 1300 feet radio tower or something. Probably the TV aerial that uh, serves the Bristol area. I'm going to cut the speed back a bit more. Now you can see there we're we're six miles away, and I'm going to use that as a guide really just to help me go down. What we can do, because you would have this um, information, is just look at the local map and zoom in. Left click, drag, and. Here's the ILS frequency dot, 110.15, and it's even got an NDB. See how nicely we flew over it and then away from it. So let, we'll, we'll put in 110.15 and see if that helps us at all. Let's just shut down the tailwind. No, oh, no, no, that's all right. I thought it had shut down. I thought it shut down 09, but in fact it shut. It shut down 27. So let's let's keep that shut down. Uh, and 110 decimal one five. Yeah. So let's push to go down here. 100. Oh, 110 decimal one five. So let's uh, put that down to one five, and then make it active, and then tell this to fly on the glide slope. <coughs> localizer on glide slope and see if uh, anything comes up. What we're doing is we're looking we're looking here for uh, the glide slope and the localizer. We've got the radar altitude coming up here. 8.5 miles. No, no, there's no rush. Just going to pull the throttle back a bit more. See if we get it in the white band. You shouldn't really fly with a cold. <coughs> the um, your reflexes are affected, and uh, you know it's, simi it's similar to having a couple of drinks flying with a cold. You get clumsy, and you can't think as fast as you normally, sh you know, can. So it's not it's not clever. It's, it's your life really you're mucking about with. I suppose if it was only your life, that would be all right. But you know you. you you're flying over other people's heads, so <clears throat> you could technically you could crash and kill them, couldn't you? And then certainly if you've got passengers in the back, you could um, you know you've got their their lives are in your hands as well. So it's a question of responsibility. Let's turn the heading bug around. Now I want to turn right, so I'm going to turn it right. Because then it then. We'll turn right to my desired heading.
I just went through to the back to tell them all to buckle up. And uh, the uh, stewardess has given me a sandwich. Uh, so, um, <coughs> yeah, so where were we? So we're coming in on nine, but um, no sign of any ILS, so. I assume I got that frequency right. Hundred and ten point one five. You see, got it wrong. Hundred and ten point one. Oh, go away. One five. Thank you. Ah, see that immediately comes alive now. Right. Well. We should be flying slightly to the right. So let's tell it to fly on nav. And see if it does anything. If it's got any sense it will turn right. But um doesn't look like it's got any sense, does it? Oh, that's what I should tell it to fly the approach. Don't want it just to fly the nav. Flying to the airport, that's what the nav's telling it to do. That's fine, I mean, that's fine. It's still not doing anything, is it? We're okay because we're below the glide slope, and <coughs> although we are off to the left, I'm wondering if telling it to fly the back course will help. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with <coughs> equipment which is so obviously faulty? Right, well we're on the glide slope, although we are heinously off to the left. So now let's slow down. I'm at, uh, I'm flying 120 now, which is a 30 degree intercept. First stage uh, laps down. Landing lights <coughs> on. Gear down. Above glide slope. Intercepting the centre line. That's not got to do too mad about intercepting the glide slope. Now I've shot through the centre line so I need to turn left coming up on the glide slope nicely though, watching the airspeed. <coughs> now I've gone through the other way. Low glide slope, right of centre line. Seriously below glide slope. Correcting on the centre line. Getting ready to turn right to Still below glide slope, a bit slow, slightly left of centre line, correcting on the glide slope, left of centre line, on glide slope, way left of centre line. Slightly higher. Didn't crash enough to the right, did I? <coughs> Above glide slope. Correcting centre line. Still above glide slope. On centre line. Now would be a good time to start steering. Zero nine zero. So steering zero nine zero on glide slope on the centre line. <coughs> 